Welcome to our Monday supper. I'm Camille Vasca, and this is my husband, Mike, who is our family's favorite candidate for attorney general. For 11 weeks now, we've joined with you and guests from our home to talk about issues important to our state and our communities. Tonight, we're joined by three guests. First, we have Mike Solon, president of the Seattle Police Officers Guild. Second, we welcome Dennis Su, president of the Seattle Chinese Chamber of Commerce. And third, we have Ann Davison Sattler, who ran for Seattle City Council last year, and this year is running for state lieutenant governor. Thank you all for joining us tonight. And now I'll turn it over to Mike. Thank you, Camille. Glad to hear I'm your favorite attorney general candidate. Tonight, we'll talk about how Seattle is losing control of its streets. Most of you know that last week, Seattle lost control of a police precinct headquarters and a several block area of Capitol Hill, which is now controlled by protesters. But honestly, Seattle has been losing control of its streets to lawlessness for several years now. It's a big news, it's big news internationally and even around the country that our city abandoned one of its police precincts to protesters. Our state has the spotlight on it, but for all the wrong reasons. A police chief is upset that politicians allowed it to happen. She said that it puts people's safety at risk, but Seattle was losing control long before the recent media attention. Nearly everyone who lives or works in Seattle knows this. I've been a lawyer in Seattle for 30 years and I've seen it firsthand. Late last year, the judges in the King County Courthouse closed the main entrance because a lawyer was almost killed as he entered. There had been 160 prior assaults on people seeking justice. As the Downtown Seattle Association has documented, criminals rob local merchants like they are ATMs. The police are told not to intervene and some retailers respond by closing downtown stores. Almost everyone who lives or works in the city has heard the stories of a neighbor or friend who was robbed. When the police arrive, they're told that it's not worth filing or filling out a criminal report because the city doesn't prosecute property crimes. And so Seattle has among the highest rates of property crimes in the entire country. These are all things that got me fired up to run for attorney general. Bob Ferguson, our current AG, and Governor Inslee have said nothing about the lawlessness in Seattle and other communities in our state. In fact, let me show you the governor's response when he was asked about the occupied zone last week. Josh, do we have that clip? Governor, I'd like to ask you about uh, what's going on in Seattle. There's this uh, thing called the Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone. What's your thought on that? The fact that the protesters have taken that over and not allowing people to come and go freely? And then well, regarding the National Guard. Well, that's news to me, so I'll have to reserve any comment about it. I, I have not I have not heard anything about that from any credible source. <laughs> not that you're not credible, it's just like before I espouse an opinion, I should know of which I speak. <laughs> Governor Jay Inslee. Bob Ferguson is obsessed with his partisan lawsuits seeking to become the darling of national partisan groups. His obsession has wasted millions of dollars that could help people in our state. So Seattle lost control of its streets years before the East Precinct was abandoned and the Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone or CHAZ was created by barricaded streets. In tonight's program, we'll talk about why Seattle lost control and what it means for the safety of its residents, workers and visitors. But first, let me share with you a little bit about my visit last week to the area controlled by protesters. I was writing something about the zone and my wife Camille said, Mike, you really shouldn't rely on reports from news media and others. They might be exaggerated. So I decided to go there myself, even though news reports said there were armed men at the barricades checking identification of people wanting to go in. As I approached early in the morning, I saw the barricades, but no armed men. We have a few pictures that I took on my uh, iPhone. Josh, I think Josh is going to show those now. It looked and had the feel like an urban campout. Tents and sleeping bags were everywhere. I used to play adult soccer on a field that had tents pitched in the goal mouth now. Aggressive graffiti and signs were everywhere. Police were denounced. Revolution was proclaimed. 
pictures were forbidden. The Seattle Police Department's East Precinct was defaced and looked abandoned. A picture of George Floyd, the black man killed by the Minneapolis police officer, overlooked the words Black Lives Matter painted on the street. That's what I saw last week. I never felt unsafe, but I could see why some would. And it was clear that Seattle has lost control. Let's start tonight's discussion with the president of the Guild representing Seattle police officers, Mike Solon. Mike, let me start by thanking you and your fellow police officers for their hard work and sacrifice during these very trying times. You've had to deal with so many challenges over the last several years, and now violent protests, vandalism, and the loss of a precinct at the direction of elected officials. You must be exhausted, but you are keeping us safe. Thank you. And then let me say that we had former King County Sheriff and Congressman Dave Reichert on last week. He counseled that now is a time for listening and healing from the tragedy of George Floyd's death. We need to do that before it's time to talk about possible police reforms. But that said, the Seattle Police Department has been under a federal court-directed reform process since 2012. That has included a federal court-appointed monitor and has resulted in, I'm told, improved training that included forbidding the kind of restraint that killed George Floyd. So any discussion about the police practices in Seattle needs to acknowledge the reform that has been taking place. So uh, Mike, are you with us? Yes, Mike, thanks for having me on tonight. I appreciate the opportunity to talk okay. about public safety issues in Seattle. Great, well, I, I got a question for you. Now, uh, I really I, I ask you for, com for comment. Did you wanna comment on the way the police department has been improved over the last several years in part because of the federal court directed process? Sure, I can talk about the Seattle Police Officers Guild officers that I represent, 1,300 of us that are public safety professionals that uh, have embraced the Department of Justice mandated reforms and without their dedication to the growth of service and to the community that they serve, we wouldn't be in the position we're in where the Department of Justice says that we have met and we are in full compliance with the reform process. And uh, it's a testament to their dedication and um, overall, I've seen an improvement with the department and its people, its employees in the past five years that is um, a model for um, quality police service, not just here in the state, but nationally and internationally as we've led with uh, just the term of de-escalation, we are that entity that people go to as far as being the leader of change and innovation. And we pride ourselves on that, on that as we basically started the de-escalation conversation in, with this department, and we're proud of that. Um, we've also seen um, just greater, uh, I would say, uh, movement and funding with just training in general. Because as I've told many people, that if you fund a police budget with money towards training, that only enhances the quality of public safety work to the community. And as we know, good training separates good cops from bad. Yes, that's um, exactly what former King County Sheriff and Congressman Dave Reichert said last week, we, he was asked a question by a viewer, what, what's the one thing you would uh, do to address some of the issues our country is facing? And he said, more training. So uh, you're on the same page there. We're starting to hear some consistency. Well, Mike, let's talk about that night when the East Precinct was abandoned. Can you describe what was happening on the streets just before for folks tuning in that, that didn't see it on the news? Yes, um, it was a definite battle for control of the East Precinct by what I deem are uh, criminal agitators, unreasonable activists that have stolen the peaceful protest message for justice for George Floyd. And those agitators um, would show up around evening time and they would uh, slowly take, start to take over 
uh, violent actions towards the police and the peaceful protesters soon faded out back to their place of residence. And it became a battle. It became uh, night after night of assaults against police officers. And what I saw on the closed circuit television footage in the East Precinct is just that. And I've called on the city officials to release that footage to inform the community of the events that took place night after night after night of officers taking heavy projectiles, uh, metal, uh, bottles, uh, frozen water bottles, um, explosive devices, fireworks, uh, you name it, was hurled at our officers resulting in significant bruises, contusions, uh, separated shoulders, uh, broken bones. And uh, one I highlight is one of my SWAT officer friends um, took a rock to his face and almost lost his right eye. So this was a significant situation where officers followed uh, command orders and those orders were to defend the police facility. And sadly, what ended up happening is that um, the narrative was being spun that the police were the agitators um, and then we started gassing people that should not have been gassed, and that's not accurate at all. What's now happened is that our ability to use those less lethal tools, which are effective in not only protecting our working conditions, protecting our health and well being, but are effective in protecting a police facility that is critical for uh, public safety service for the entire community that encompasses the East Precinct. And slowly but surely, as the injuries mounted and the political pressure put forth on our public officials, um, ultimately the public officials in the city of Seattle decided to uh, surrender the East Precinct. Thus, all those nights when we were asked to hold the line and protect that police facility was for naught. And now we are left with a situation where we don't even, we aren't even allowed to access a six block square area in the city of Seattle as far as police services are concerned. And we are no longer in control of a police facility. It's a major public safety issue. Uh, we've been joined by a number of uh, viewers. Let me just uh, remind us all that I'm Mike Vasca, a candidate for attorney general. This is our Monday supper. And our first guest tonight is Mike Solon. Um, who is the president of the Seattle Police Officers Guild. Um, Mike, it sounds like your officers were bravely holding the line against anarchy that night. And they were, as you just mentioned, uh, the politicians, or at least some politicians, ordered them to, um, to leave. Um, how, how do your officers, uh, the members that you represent, how do they feel about that and, um, you know, being uh, ordered to abandon their headquarters on Capitol Hill. Devastating, devastating to say the least. If we're not allowed to use the tools that are needed and necessary, that are authorized per policy to be used for crowd control management in riotous, assaultive, violent behavior, then what's left? The only thing left if those tools are removed are our physical bodies and our riot uh, batons. Therefore, that would lead to more injuries to community members or the officers, thus resulting in physical confrontations. What less lethal tools do is they provide us a buffer, uh, a gap, a reactionary gap, or maybe a de-escalation de gap where the standoff between violent criminal agitators and police on those who were in the police officers holding those lines to protect that police facility. If that's removed, then we're left with an untenable situation. And the political decision was made to surrender the East Precinct due to optics. And for me as a peace officer for 21 years um, and being the uh, president of the Seattle Peace Officers Guild, number one, my main concern is to obviously look after the membership, their health and well being, their working conditions. But more importantly, as a police officer, my job is to serve the city, serve the community. And what's occurred is violates that to a degree where quality professional police service is now being uh, impacted in a manner that is detrimental to the public safety's 
um, public safety issue here in the city, and particularly the general public that comprises the East Precinct. It's absolutely stunning that we're in this situation. I want to, I want to ask you a couple of questions about that, but um, for our viewers, we're getting a lot of questions. Thank you for your questions. We're going to try to get to as many of them as we can. Uh, we really do appreciate it. Um, it will do our best, but uh, obviously there's a high level of interest in this topic tonight. Um, so Mike, let's talk about the impact of the loss of the East Precinct on um, the ability of, of you and your uh, police officer members to protect the public. What impact has the loss of, of the use of that building had? It's had a profound impact. And um, what we're seeing now is priority one calls, which are main emergency situations such as robbery, rape, kidnapping, murder, people calling 911 for help. Those are for, for significant resources to get there quick. Those are priority one calls for the city of Seattle Police Department. Where typically we were, our average response time to those, I believe without having the numbers in front of me, I think it was around three minutes, three to five minutes, which is pretty quick in a major urban area. Um, now we're seeing that triple the response time. So we're hovering around 18 minutes now. And to me, that is unacceptable for any community member to have to wait for police help. And that's had a detrimental impact on public safety issues surrounding the East Precinct. But that impact on the police officer's mental health and morale in terms of why they became a cop and they can't really help people because they're hindered by politics to me is, um, you know, when you lose a precinct that removes their ability to properly house police equipment and be in an advantageous geographical location in order to get to those homes, businesses, places where that 911 call came from to help them is, uh, is, is a significant problem. Um Alan, hopefully I get his name right. Alan in Renton asks if, as a result of um, the decisions made that led to the loss of the uh, East Precinct building, um, have you lost officers? Have officers resigned or, or quit the force? Um, I have heard of officers turning their packets in. Uh, I can tell you, I, I can't speak to uh, the numbers. You'd have to ask the department of, on that. Um, but our morale has taken a significant significant hit. And I don't want to come across as being victims here. I mean, this is, we're dealing with a situation and I think we have for a long period of time. We need to have a conversation about race in all parts of our system, not just the police. And, um, you know, we are, or we are, uh, I've already mentioned this before that we are uh, viewed even by our national public officials such as President Barack Obama saying that the police department is a model of reform and that we have entities, other agencies looking at us to be that model. Um, and we are now dealing with a major societal topic that is difficult. However, we're still showing up to work because that's our oath of service. And, but just as being human beings, yeah, this is, uh, it's been pretty difficult for us and we recognize and we, we understand the anger and uh, it's absolutely um, a, a really, really difficult situation. Well, again, thank you for all you're doing and all of your members. Um, I, I talk to people every day that are so proud of what you're doing and, and realize you know, how much great work has been done to improve the department over the last several several years. Um, so keep that in mind. Hopefully your members will keep that in mind. Um, let me ask you a question about the West Precinct. Protesters have been leaving the autonomous zone on Capitol Hill to surround the West Precinct headquarters in Belltown. Um, why is the West Precinct important? And are you concerned about those protests, which I think are happening almost every night around the West Precinct? Well, we understand that, you know, we, uh, we support the right of a peaceful assembly. It's part of our oath of service to uphold the Constitution, First Amendment. Um, 
we are in uh, Seattle and we understand that there are uh, on a lot of occasions uh, protests that just come out of uh, nowhere. And we, 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 we welcome that all the time. Um, however, what's significant about surrendering an East Precinct to a small group of criminal agitators that have unfortunately stolen a peaceful protest message, but have also hijacked the overall reasonable community of Seattle due to their political will, if you will, um, if the East Precinct is voluntarily surrendered, what's to stop the same group of people to march on another police facility? In particular, the West Precinct, which is the department's flagship statement, uh, flagship uh, precinct in the heart of downtown. And that houses our 911 call center. And one can only imagine if that type of political pressure is put on the department to try to protect that police facility. And then now if we've lost the ability to use those chemical munitions, those less lethal tools that effectively allow us to defend that police facility so we can continue to provide public safety service to our community at large, it's a serious situation. Because what happens if you lose the 911 communication center? How are we gonna be able to get to those people across the city if we're not aware or we can't respond to their call for help? Well, if we, if we had more time tonight, we, I, we could talk about that protest. I saw some clips of it last night and it was truly, I'm not easily frightened, but it was truly frightening to me. Um, let me, let's go back to the East Precinct. Um, we received an email from a man who bought a condo recently in the area controlled by protesters. He says he's fearful for his safety and that he's contacted the mayor, the governor, and our two US senators asking for help and he's gotten no response. Do you have any advice for him or others that happen to live in that occupied zone? Uh, well, my first and foremost concern is for their safety and that I empathize with their situation. It's absolutely tragic. Um, somebody that lives within the city that actually owns property that puts their hard work money into the tax base, they should have a reasonable expectation of public safety service provided to them due to their tax, tax money going to that expectation. Um, my advice is to, you have to now be your own activist and you have to be that reasonable activist to counter the unreasonable activism that unfortunately has a stranglehold of your rights. And if we don't wake up as to what's going on in the city to protect people such as the person who took the time to tell you about this, then where are we in society? How can we voluntarily give a precinct to a large, I'll, I'll walk that back, to a small group of criminal agitators that now occupy six city blocks? Um, I feel so sorry for that individual. And so lobby your local public official, emails, get out and demand, get in the media, use social media, coordinate your group of people that you can think can garner the energy to have a voice that can be heard. Because the longer this goes, the more people like the individual that you just broached a question with are gonna come out. And the more uh, spotlight we can shine on this, the better it is for everyone's public safety needs in the city of Seattle, in particular, the East Precinct. Okay, Mike, uh, thank you for that. We're gonna come back to you in a few minutes. Now I want to introduce Dennis Su, who is president of the Seattle Chinese Chamber of, Chamber of Commerce. Uh, welcome, Dennis. For many decades, you've been working to improve the Chinatown International District. Can you talk a bit about your work and describe the public safety issues that you've seen? Well, uh, 
I've only been the uh, president for a year, but in the past, I've been helping the Chinatown community to put up the annual sea fair parade. And so, as you can see, as a small city section that holds the sea fair, not the entire torchlight parade, but the Chinatown sea fair parade, public safety has been on our concern year after year. And recently we faced the homeless camp issue uh, that have a big impact, uh, particularly remember uh, three years ago or four years ago, underneath the King Street uh, freeway, we have lines and lines of camps, but that's exactly the same spot where our CP parade assembly with few hundred kids, drill teams and marching bands assemble. And, and you can see the, the, the public safety uh, headaches that we face, uh, the chamber face. Uh, and also Chinatown uh, International District is, is one of the unique neighborhood in the city that we have the highest concentration of small businesses, namely restaurants and food services. And the others are the elderly. We have concentration of uh, government funded uh, elderly housing projects. So the two ele major elements are also highly depending on the safety to become a vibrant neighborhood. So uh, that's my experience working down there with the community show me how important it is to have the, uh, uh, like this time uh, the uh, officer Solon talk about the importance of police work. That we would um, okay, thank you. Uh, you're, uh, if you're just joining us, you're watching um, the Monday Supper Show. Uh, I'm Mike Vasca, candidate for Attorney General. Um, and uh, Dennis, let's come back to you. Uh, our, uh, I understand the concerns about homelessness in the um, Chinatown International District. Um, are there uh, concerns for um, the residents' safety in that district? And if so, you know, has that gotten, has that changed over time? Uh, yes. As I mentioned, uh, we have a 24-hour situation down there besides the restaurants business are uh, the elderly and the relatives are visiting, the family they're visiting. And in the past, uh, there, there are, there were cases of, of, of purse snatching, uh, probably the one of the higher uh, ratio in, uh, within the city, uh, because of the elderly, have become an easy target by by the criminals. Uh, so, in the in the past, the chamber, along with other uh, Chinatown organizations, working closely with the city hall to address the uh, safety issue. And, and every so often the city, uh, the uh, mayor and, and police chief is come down and have some uh, PR sessions with our organization representative. And we really appreciate that. But again, those are the daytime show so at night time, the criminal still came out and do their own things. So uh, as you can see, uh, with a neighborhood with so many elderly and, and small businesses counting on uh, customers uh, is a challenge. Now, I understand that the East Precinct, which um, has been abandoned to the protesters or because of the protesters, uh, I understand that serves the Chinatown International District. Are there new levels of public safety concerns now that it's closed? Uh, yes and no. We've been before the uh, this incidents uh, a couple of months ago. This we were already fighting with the city hall uh, to address the homeless cam issue. Back to the basic security, public security um, subject. Um, but this particular uh, chat, chads issue uh, 
from our sources down in Chinatown. Yes, they said by the time they uh, call the like Officer Solon reported the the uh, message they got from the uh, police department is we're sorry we're shorthanded we uh, blah 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 uh, the t waiting time is 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 unacceptable again and so unfortunately I think the criminal elements also know about that so the, uh, several businesses got freaking daytime and night times now because they know they got, they got enough time to get away. So uh, yeah, it's pretty sad. Okay, thank, thank you, Dennis. We're gonna come back to you in a minute. Um, now let me introduce Ann Davidson, Davison Sattler who last year ran for Seattle City Council and this year is running for Lieutenant Governor. She's also a youth soccer coach in Seattle. I did that for 10 years in Issaquah, so Ann and I have a lot to talk about, not politics, but uh, Ann, let me first ask you why you decided to run for city council last year. It's, a, I think, a pretty compelling story. Thanks, Mike, for having me on. Um, yeah, I really never dreamt really ever that I would be sitting before you talking to members of the public as a political candidate. But it really is just the years that my young children uh, asking me pointed questions about their observations in their hometown of Seattle, what they were seeing. Clearly people in need that were unable to take care of themselves, that needed shelter, uh, that looked confused and disoriented, uh, you know, in the that's putting it in adult terms, not how my kids ask the questions, obviously. Why was someone asleep uh, when we, I probably assumed that they were passed out. They, they, we did not know why someone was there. These are the things, the inadequate lack, the, the inadequate response to problems on the ground, to homelessness, public safety, and addiction and mental health. These are the issues that I kept talking about for years with my kids. And I just, I reached out just like that man you mentioned uh, that owns the property in the East Precinct. I reached out to my representative on city council and I heard nothing, no response. Uh, and I just said, this is just unacceptable. Uh, and so I decided we needed to have people that are normally not engaged in politics, need to step forward and take a stand uh, so we can see some improvement in the quality of life for everybody. So that's really why I ran for city council last year. And um, as I understand it, uh, you considered yourself a Democrat last year, uh, but now you're running for office as a Republican. How did your experience running for city council inspire you to switch parties? You know, it was it, it's strange. It was a nonpartisan race. Our city council in Seattle is supposed to be nonpartisan. Uh, and I would say it's anything but that. Um, it really uh, became a, a force of politics. I, because I was calling uh, the, what the approaches that I felt were necessary, which was we need to handle the situation about homelessness. We need to have adequate responses for that, not leaving people to subsist along the roadways. And because of my requiring that with the tax dollars that we had, because we had an ample budget, we were just misusing the large amount of funds we had uh, on homelessness. Because of that, I was actually labeled a closet conservative and a closet Republican. And I thought to myself, and this was from power holders within the Democrat establishment here, uh, not the voters. Voters at the door were supportive and were sick of the lack of public safety and not being able to take their young kids to the parks. Uh, but those power holders used the easy tactic of labeling me in a nonpartisan race. Uh, and I decided if they, if this was their way of, of dealing with homelessness was just to leave people clearly in need and just increase the cost of, of doing the same ineffective policies, I didn't want to be a part of it anymore. So I've done a walk away video uh, explaining even more about that if people want to sh watch that because uh, watching the dichotomy of calling ourselves green and then allowing and we restored an area along a creek. Uh, spending millions of dollars on that and then allowing people to camp along along it using it as their toilet and trash can just wasting those tax dollars i decided that just isn't something that i want to support anymore so um i am speaking from the republican side of the aisle now because i feel like we have to have people who are talking about pragmatic sensible because i don't use the term common sense anymore sensible approaches uh, that take into account the, the tax bill uh, so that we can really start to see improvements on the quality of life. Um, and how, how is your campaign going and where would people go to get more information about it? 
Well, it's certainly going much different than last year's when I was able to knock on over 23,000 doors. I sure miss that being out with voters. Um, so it is unusual, but it is going fa fabulous. Uh, we are uh, the top Republican to support by far, uh, as far as endorsements and as far as fundraising. And if people want to find out more, they can go to the campaign website. It is Neighbors for Ann. It's all one word, Neighbors, F-O-R-A-N-N.com. Um, and it's the same place I was uh, as last year, the same social media, uh, because it's the, the same problems are still needing to be addressed as they were since 2015 when we declared a state of emergency on homelessness at the city of Seattle and King County and then did nothing. Okay, now let's bring all three of you together and compare notes on how Seattle lost control, not just of its police precinct and the CHAZ, but even before then. And let me start by observing that Seattle elected a self-proclaimed socialist to the city council in 2014. The party Kashama Sawant belongs to is called Socialist Alternative, but its website says it is a Marxist party, yes, really, that seeks to have workers control all the major companies and to be paid according to their need, not ability. Sawant, her allies, and others say they have a movement to push the city toward the utopian fringes of a socialist political system. Mm -hmm. You cannot make this stuff up. So let me start with Mike Solon, mm -hmm. president of the Seattle Police Officers Guild. Since Sawant was elected six years ago, what have you seen that has led to a decline of public safety in our city? I can only speak to uh, what impacts my working conditions with the members of the Seattle Police Officers Guild and particularly those public safety issues. Um, I just wanna make sure that the audience understands that I can't endorse anybody right now or speak on behalf of anything political. Um, but understand that public safety issues impacting our city are, are profound. Um, the amount of uh, calls for service for law enforcement resources, in particular those camps, where those camps are uh, becoming more and more violent um, and I've been on multiple um, operations with the, uh, the SWAT team to uh, do warrant services to remove violent offenders and to remove guns from those homeless encampments is, um, is astronomical. Um, it's, I can't describe to you the, the living conditions accurately in this setting. You would only have to see it in person to believe it. And I think some of us on this call have you know, voiced that um, voice that sentiment, but it's until you see it firsthand, it's hard to describe. And um, I don't see how we're allowing this to occur is compassion. Right. And it seems to be getting worse. And what that does to the people that I represent is make their job that much more difficult. And we don't have the resources to be able to um, address those public safety issues in those camps. And then what does that do for the overall reasonable majority of the citizens of the city? It falls in line with just how we lost the East Precinct. That's tangible. But what is also tangible is that we're losing this city to lawlessness and the rule of law is lost. And I'm very deeply concerned about the working conditions that impact the police officers on the street. We're already below numbers for minimum staffing on a daily basis. How can we, how can we continue, how can we address those encampments when our call volumes are already rising? I, I feel deep uh, empathy for the citizens of the city at this time. Uh, all right, and you ran with several other candidates in other districts to retire council members who are aligned with or sympathetic to Sawant's movement. What impact did the city council and Sawant have on public safety in, in your view? Massive. I mean, I reiterate everything that Mike just said, unfortunately. The decline of our city is evident since 2015. It really is year by year by year. When I would go downtown to the law firm I worked at downtown, there, it used to be clean. All the streets were litter free. There was no one on the sides of the road. This was in 2011 when my son was born. I mark it when my youngest son was born in 2011. And then it started to come where 
why are we having to answer these questions when my kids were four and six? Then we were chased by somebody out of the bushes, swearing at us, yelling at, for my kids to come back. And they remember everything that was said. This is going on for years. And the incumbent I was trying to replace, I really feel like it's just apathetic. We don't have anyone who is carrying the torch saying, this has got to stop. Mike's right, the rule of law has got to govern. We have laws so we can live in close proximity of one another and they are not being enforced. Uh, we had an encampment behind the LA Fitness in the North End. I went out there myself to talk to employees because it had been become so difficult. And someone posted on, a, on a next door about talking to the employees there. There were 25 officer cards. So Mike's officers came out and talk to them. But I talked to residents there of their break-ins, of then it finally took, and they were calling the city so many times, and it finally took what? A fire. Finally, then the city showed up and said, we need to make sure this camp is cleared out because they had tapped the electricity of the gym and putting it down into their encampment. So it's right. I worked in a refugee camp on the border of Cambodia and the conditions there were more humane and compassionate then we are people living alongside the roadways here in Seattle. And this is America and we are allowing this to happen. And we're allowing it to happen because of the city council's inaction and really wanting to solve people's problems and getting quality of life improved. And Dennis, um, I don't know if you wanna weigh in on this uh, somewhat political question, um, uh, up to you. Well, we do have our hands-on experience with the homeless camps, like I mentioned before, normally during the, uh, the uh, seafare parade route issues, public safety issues. But in the uh, two months ago, I think uh, several city council members were proposing a legislator about having the police and the other city agency hands off from the, mm. the homeless camp along Dearborn and 10th Avenue and, and around mm. the Chinatown area. That has this community organized in a major letter writing uh, campaign uh, two months ago. And, and again, because of a few city council members proposed that. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we, we had our, our share of uh, headache. <laughs> Thank you for uh, uh, inviting me to share some thoughts. Okay. Well, it sure looks like uh, Sawant and her allies have successfully hijacked at least parts of the Black Lives uh, Matters movement to advance their agenda. According to a local newspaper, a speaker at one rally said to Sawant, please stop using Black Lives Matter for your political campaigns. It's important that we recognize there are two separate issues. First, we have the important conversation about how we address racial injustice in our country. Second, we have concerns about public safety and homelessness leading to a loss of control of our streets in Seattle and other communities across our state. On our show last week, we talked about the racial injustice issue and we will again in future shows. It's a very, very important issue. As your next attorney general, I will create a statewide task force to address homelessness and related public safety issues. I will work to ensure our communities regain control of their streets. So in closing tonight, let me ask the three of you what Seattle and other communities can do to regain control of our street of our streets and make them safe again. Dennis, let me ask you as the president of the Seattle Chinese Chamber of Commerce, what you think are at least some of the solutions? Well, it, it has to be community and the city agencies partnership. I mean, each community has their own unique issues and challenge and the city has enough resources out there if it's appropriately paired up and utilized. And again, uh, the other speaker already mentioned some, some of the, the uh, wasted efforts uh, or misdirected uh, focus. But uh, I think we have to sit down and, and have a special team of put, put a concerned citizen together to, to work things out. I don't think one or agency or, or department can can solve this complex issues. I agree with that. Uh, Mike Solon, as the president of the Seattle Police Officers Guild, what do you think we need to do to get back control of our streets? 
Well, I would like to be invited to the table for these important discussions as a stakeholder. And to date, we have not been invited. Mm. And I think that that is quite telling. So that is the first obstacle. And then hopefully we can glean some information from those talks. So the average perspective of a line officer that I represent is heard. Because if we're asking to do these public safety services to the majority of the Seattle populace, I think our voice is pretty profound in order to move the needle on these discussions. So that's first and foremost. And uh, finally, Ann Davis and Sattler, you're running for Lieutenant Governor and you've lived in Seattle for many years. What are some of the things you think we need to do to get control over our streets? Yeah, my uh, neighborhood right out of law school was just a couple of blocks from that East Precinct. Um, and so I had no car and I walked around there all the time. And um, that was in 2005. So it's, it's interesting to see how that now um, is really changed. We need to have political balance. I mean, that is really what we are lacking. We have got to have a check and balance in place and that is at multiple levels. Um, and that really is what I see. We have a lot of group think where there is not critical analysis about problems and what is the tr strategic approach for that problem? What's the right approach? Uh, we have consensus and people just want to stay focused on the same solution. Um, and I agree that these, the message that um, is about, uh, we need to be talking about racial equality and making sure that those voices are not lost uh, I've, I've seen that firsthand, but that is hijacked. We have got to make sure that we elect people that are there who want to listen to constituents. That means they respond. We've got this not happening here. If people do not respond to you, you should not vote for them again. It is not difficult. I did casework in Capitol Hill and we would respond by letter. This was before email was around. We responded to everybody, regardless of the party. If they don't respond to you, do not vote them back. You have got to get people who care about the future of our city and our state. And that means they have the guts to step forward and ask questions and demand that we say it is time to be accountable and have people in office that are bold leasers and decision makers and do not lay down and let things just evolve and they check their shoulders and who should I support? Where's the majority? What should I say? we have got to have leaders in place. And that means political balance. We are out of balance. Even me as a political outsider can see it. You need to vote for different people. Sorry, okay, thank I got a little animated, thank Mike, sorry. <laughs> no, that's your running for office. That's what you gotta do. Uh, well, thank you, Ann uh, Davis and Sattler, Dennis Sue and Mike Solon for joining our program tonight. As we've discussed, Seattle and other communities have been losing control over their streets for some time now. The occupation and control of several city blocks in Seattle and the forced abandonment of a police precinct headquarters is just the exclamation point on that story. But all this attention on the issue can become a catalyst for a movement to regain control of our streets. As some of you have heard me say before, my father was a homeless refugee in Europe at the end of World War II. Lawlessness and starvation were everywhere, but then American forces arrived and through compassion and respect for the rule of law, the huddled masses of Europe were lifted up to a better future. So as troubling as these issues now seem, we must be confident that we will overcome them and get to a better, safer place. That is my goal as your next Attorney General. Thank you for joining our live stream. Thank you again to our guests and to my uh, family, Camille and my two sons, Grant and Nathan, for their help and Josh behind the camera. You can learn more about me at my website, mikevasca.com, and you can make a contribution there if you'd like as well. Have a great week. Thank you for joining us.